Well, today is forecast to mark the final day of Sydney's unseasonable spring heat, but it will be the hottest of the lot. Joining us live now, New South Wales Opposition Leader Mark Speakman. Mark, good to see you. Thanks for your time. We'll talk the budget in just a moment, but firstly on this heat and the upcoming season in general, which has now, as you know, been classified as El Nino, are you satisfied that our state defences are in the best shape that they can be in battle, uh, in the inevitable battle against fires that will emerge undoubtedly? Well, we have uh, extremely professional uh, fire and rescue and rural fire service staff here in New South Wales. Uh, we've known for some time that El Nino will, will be back. Uh, it's now back and uh, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, we've got the best preparation we can. OK, on to the budget. What's your assessment? Look, it's a pretty disappointing budget. You would expect a government that's uh, been out of office uh, for 12 years would come back with a bit of a vision. There's, there's no vision in this budget. Uh, there's really no new infrastructure programs. What we've got are a lot of dodgy figures. Uh, there's an heroic assumption that wage growth will, or employee expenses will be limited to 4.1% every year for four years. They've just done a deal with the Teachers Federation offering teachers between 10% and 80%. Uh, for the next year. Uh, it's pretty hard to see how other frontline workers like fireys and police and paramedics are going to sit back and uh, and, and uh, ask for something far less. So there's a dodgy assumption about employee expenses. They've uh, uh, removed uh, our, um, our control of wages policy and basically let uh, uh, the genie out of the bottle. Uh, they've got uh, expense growth 0.8% in the budget and yet they've got employee expenses growing at 4.1%. Hard to reconcile that. The ratings agencies are already critical of that. No allowance for the cost of expanding a RARing. Uh, no allowance for toll relief after two years. So a lot of dodgy assumptions uh, in okay. this budget. OK, a bit to pick through there, Mark. But uh, firstly, on to wages. Weren't higher wages needed, particularly for our teachers? I mean, we all know the state of our schools, particularly when those NAPLAN results come through. Look, no one begrudges uh, teachers and, uh, and police and nurses uh, higher, higher wages, but the government went to the election promising that it would all be funded from productivity savings. Uh, that's what Chris Min said in his budget and reply speech last year, there'd be productivity bargaining. Uh, they went to the election promising it wouldn't cost the taxpayer a cent. We now know it's going to cost the taxpayer at least $8 billion over four years, uh, and there hasn't been a single productivity offset identified. Okay, so so your 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 beef isn't isn't the wage rises, just where the money's coming from. Well, that's right. We always want to pay our, our frontline workers as much as possible, uh, but the government uh, gave a solemn assurance that it all be done from productivity offsets. We haven't seen a single productivity offset identified. Uh, in the meantime, the government's had a windfall. They've had uh, they're expecting fourteen billion dollars more in payroll tax, stamp duty, and land tax mm. uh, in the next four years, and uh, instead of putting that, you know. In yeah. investing in a housing fund, for example, they're, they're blowing it on uncontrolled wage increases. Well, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Stamp Duty. I mean, that leads me to one of my questions about housing. I mean, perhaps it is the most important issue that's facing the country and facing the state right now, housing affordability. There's $2 billion in the kitty for it. Do, do you not support that spend? Well, look, uh, we support anything that will improve uh, housing supply in New South Wales. We, we know that uh, right across Australia there is a crisis uh, and uh, that we support the general direction of, uh, of more housing, more density around uh, transit uh, hubs. Uh, but what this government uh, lacks is imagination. Uh, it, it had a couple of signature pieces yesterday. One was a $1.5 billion to $2 billion investment, which is largely coming out of uh, contributions from developers. So uh, that they are taxing developers and then giving them back uh, in the form of contributions. So it, it's really just spinning money around. Landcom was their other big initiative, but that's going to build 300 houses a year over the next 15 or 16 years. That, that's just a drop in the ocean. OK, but uh, isn't that more than what your government was doing? Well, uh, look, we had a number of initiatives and uh, we welcomed these initiatives, but it really... A, a government is just back in office after 12 years. If this, is, if this is their vision, it's sadly lacking. Given the state of... The debt, though, across the state at the moment, much of it was increased by your government because of because of COVID, and and a lot of that was necessary. But isn't now the time for fiscal discipline? Well, there isn't much fiscal discipline from this government. They've had a fourteen billion dollar windfall uh, of extra unexpected collections in land tax, payroll tax, and stamp duty. Uh, they're not retiring debt using that. What they're doing is is using that to fund it, fund wage increases. That they said we're going to come from productivity offsets. So this idea that this is a fiscally responsible budget is a myth. Just finally here, Mark, uh, 
This brouhaha in the hunter over wind turbines. The Federal Energy Minister received a frosty reception yesterday by some protesters. Can this plan to install the turbines in the ocean go ahead in your view? Well, look, uh, I, I, I won't comment about whether it finally can go ahead, but undoubtedly, undoubtedly, uh, we need to expedite the rollout of renewables. But we need to bring communities along. We need to make sure that uh, local communities are comfortable with uh, with both onshore and offshore renewable energy. Uh, but in the next few years, uh, we have to get the um, our renewable energy out as fast as possible. OK, but I mean, there's concerns about what it will do to the environment. These, you know, these these turbines out in the sea what it will do to the skyline, what it will do to the environment, what it will do to tourism. I mean, do you share those concerns from, from the locals up there? Well, I understand those concerns, uh, and that's why there's got to be proper environmental impact assessments uh, and those issues thoroughly looked at to make sure that local communities are satisfied that uh, there's a plus for them in the, the jobs that renewable energy creates uh, and the energy security we get. But at the right. end of the day, uh, you've got you've got to do the, you've got to do the work. You've got to look at the detail. You've got to do the environmental assessments and satisfy local communities uh, that it's a plus for their community. So, do you have a, a preference whether it be onshore or offshore when it comes to these wind turbines? Look, uh, I'm not a uh, <laughs> I'm not an engineer. My understanding is that uh, offshore uh, wind uh, can, is probably more reliable. Uh, and uh, ultimately, um, mm. that's what we want. We, are, we want reliable and affordable energy in New South Wales. So I think we're going to have to do both in the next uh, in the next few years. Okay, lengthy chat there, Mark Speakman. Appreciate your time, though. Thank you.